reside in VA, ride in VA. But why me when I die? I'm gon' die in VA. Virginia's for lovers, but trust this ain't here for out of town. And Virginia is going to be the first permanent successful British settlement in North America. It's the first of the 13 colonies, and in this lecture, we're going to take a look at the settlement of Jamestown. Now, this story begins with the King of England, King James, who the colony is named after, and he becomes the King of England in 1603. And there's all sorts of reasons why England wants to expand, right? They're competing with Spain. England's population was growing very rapidly. There's recessions that are leaving people with no opportunities, lack of work. There's the law of primogeniture, where the firstborn son gets all the land, all the estate, and it left all these younger sons with a lot of ambition and nowhere to go. And so this is going to be the moment where England's going to put itself literally on the map of North America. Remember, they failed at Royanoke. Now, before you go, you got to get permission before you stay or go from the king. Darling, you got to let me know. Should I stay or should I go? And that's going to be a charter. Whether or not you stay or go, that permission from the king is known as a charter. And basically, it's his blessing to go off under the, the flag of England to go establish these colonies. Now, while the king is the one who's going to permit this colonization to take place, he's not going to be the one to pay for it. And if you're looking at, you know, this idea of who's going to pay for this colony, it's not going to be the monarch. It's not going to be the king. Royal Oak was an expensive failure, and the king uh, had neither the time nor the resources to invest in might have, could have, would have, should have. So what you're going to see in the colonization of Virginia is there's going to be another uh, place that money was going to come from, and that is in the form of a joint stock Company. And this money, in the case of Virginia, is going to come from a joint stock company called the Virginia Company of London. And it's established in 1606. And this thing's great. It's basically uh, what we would call a corporation. And the idea behind it is you get many different investors and the reason you do that is you're able to share the profits and possibly the losses you're able to raise a lot of money and minimize the risk which is always a good thing and so the virginia company of london is established in 1606 there's their seal you see right there and they're going to be the one in late 1606 who is going to seek to establish this colony and the colony of Virginia is going to be founded in 1607 in the Chesapeake Bay. And it's important you know that because on the AP exam or just if you're, you know, interested in U.S. history, the Chesapeake Bay is this region right here. And, of course, there is Virginia today. Now, they established this colony. Uh, they set sail. They got over 100 people aboard three different ships and they land near the mouth of the Chesapeake River. And they establish a small settlement, uh, and this is a depiction of that. Now, in honor of the king, King James, they call the settlement Jamestown. Now, that's pretty awesome, right? If you're the king of England and you get something named after you on the other side of the globe, a place that already had a name. But anyways, I digress. Now, who's in this, you know, joint stock company, who are the, the people who are going to be the colonizers? And the answer to that question is, it's a whole bunch of over 100 men. I know, I know. Relax, everyone on the internet world. It just got hot in here. Now, these men, over a hundred of them, that's important because when it comes to the New England colonies, it's going to be a mix. There's going to be families and women, but in the Chesapeake, the first round of settlers are men. Now, what you need to keep in mind is these guys, over a hundred of them, arrive in the Chesapeake Bay, establish the colony of Virginia, Jamestown, and they're sailing and they're going from clear over here in England, and they're sailing in these ships 
three different ships. It's around four to five months. They stop over in Puerto Rico. Like, 40 dudes die on the way there. Um, they're all a bunch of dudes. They land in the Chesapeake Bay. They establish Jamestown, and boom. Success. Not really. What you need to keep in mind is they're actually looking for something. They're going there. Remember, the whole point of the joint stock company, minimize the risk and hopefully maximize the profits. And what they're looking for in Virginia is... So with all you got in your boys, dig up Virginia boys. They're looking for gold. They're looking for gold or silver or some sort of resource that can get them uh, enormous amounts of wealth. Yeah, there's secondary motivations. They're looking for a sea passage to Asia. They're also trying to demonstrate England's power and influence. But really, it's the search for gold, wealth. And remember, this is something that other countries had established. When we take a look at pre-contact Western Hemisphere, there was an empire, the Aztec Emperor Empire. There was the Inca Empire. And remember what happened there both Hernan Cortez and Francisco Pizarro established and conquered those areas and created enormous amounts of wealth for Spain. Now, what about our dudes over in Virginia? Are they going to be successful? Well, they land in 1607, and the Virginia Company of London nearly fails for a whole number of reasons. And here they are. One, there's a lot of unrealistic expectations. These guys are thinking they're going to go there, they're going to find some you know, wealth, and they're going to conquer it and just get rich. Doesn't happen. In fact, many of these guys are aristocrats. They're wealthy or you know, they're not accustomed to doing hard work. They're not interested in growing food or trying to you know, establish farms. And so as a result, they don't have any food. Poor location. First rule in real estate, location, location, location. They established their settlement in an area that is known as the Tidewater, meaning it's a mix of salt water and fresh water. It's very salty. It's very swampy. There's a lot of disease-carrying mosquitoes in the area. And since they didn't plant food and they landed there too late in the season to actually do so, they're going to suffer from starvation. Of about 114 settlers, only 34 of them are going to survive the first year. There's a lack of leadership in the colony. You know, they have all these guys and they're there to make wealth and create wealth or conquer wealth, but not any strong leadership. And then, of course, there's the fact that this place already has people living there. And this is not this ideal paradise that they were hoping for and they're going to have a difficult time. In fact, in the early period of Jamestown settlement, it's known as the starving time. All right, Lewis, I'm hungry. And this starving time was quite horrible. There is huge problems with malaria and dysentery and other diseases. Dysentery like super diarrhea. There's very brackish water, so it's unsuitable for drinking. There's a lack of food. Um, and, you know, it's just not going very well at all. You got a bunch of guys unaccustomed to doing work, and there's all sorts of different numbers, but one number is by 1610, only 61 out of 500 colonists survive. And there is some evidence that there was cannibalism taking place in the colony because they were so desperate for food. Now, how do things turn around? Well, one of the reasons is because of this guy, John Smith. John Smith comes to the colony and instills a sense of leadership. From now on, you will speak only when spoken to. And the first and last words out of your filthy sewers will be, sir. Do you maggots understand that? Sir, yes, sir. And John Smith is kind of a, a badass. He was uh, a career soldier. He had fought over in Eastern Europe before he came to the Western Hemisphere. And he instituted a policy of, if you don't work, you don't eat. And basically, he kind of gets the colony slightly turned in the correct direction. And of course, the most famous thing about John Smith that we all remember is Pocahontas saving his life. And this is a painting that is completely inaccurate. And if you want to know why or how, post a comment and I'll tell you. Now, John Smith, of course, gets a makeover by Disney. There is the Disney version and there is a 
depiction of John Smith probably a little bit more realistic than Disney. Now, back to the colony, here's the thing. I told you there were already people living there. In fact, John Smith, when he plotted and mapped the region that they were settling, this is John Smith's work, you see the settlement, Jamestown, up there in the upper middle part, but you also see a name by the name of Powhatan. And there were roughly anywhere between 15,000 and 20,000 Native American people in what is today eastern part of Virginia when these British colonists arrive. There are all sorts of different tribes, but the English kind of just label them into a Powhatan Confederacy. And there's all these different villages. You see the settlement of Jamestown right here on the map, but you got all these different Indian settlements. Now, these people are rolling deep. There's a lot more of them than the British, and these individuals are there, and they're kind of collectively known as Powhatan's tribe. And the reason why they're called Powhatan's Confederacy is because the leader, one of the head chiefs in the region, was a guy who was a little suspicious, rightfully so, of what all these European people were doing in his backyard. And Chief Powhatan is kind of one of the key figures, and he's really essential uh, to the colony's survival in its early period. You know, in the beginning, he is providing them with some basic food during the difficult winter, and Powhatan's key, and what's going to happen is you're going to have these cultural clashes between the English and the Native American people in the area. Um, Powhatan also happens to be Daddy of Pocahontas. More on that in a moment. Now here's the big dilemma. You have this starving time. John Smith kind of establishes things. You have the Native Americans. They're suspicious. And the key though is, how are you going to get people to actually go to this colony? You know, this is an advertisement for a voyage to America, roughly 1609. And the question is, you need to have some reason why people are going to go clear across four-month voyage and come to this place, Jamestown, and the guy who figures out a way to make the colony profitable is that guy, John Rolfe. John Rolfe, an Englishman, discovers something that is going to be key to the economic prosperity of the colony, and that thing is... Smokin'! In 1612, he is going to figure out the cultivation of tobacco in the colonial settlement. And this thing's huge for a number of reasons, but the big one is it gives the colony something profitable that they could export. It gives them a commodity, an item that could be traded and sold. And this tobacco product Smoking. causes all sorts of changes to the colony. One is, of course, now you have this profitable export, but now you need money, you need capital, and you need workers, you need people to actually develop the cultivation of this product. And tobacco requires a lot of land, and it's pretty difficult, it's pretty labor-intensive. So what happens in Virginia is you have the formation of these large plantations, huge farms owned by very wealthy individuals, and the entire economic system of the Chesapeake region, Virginia, is going to be based on this cash crop. And the labor force is going to be done by a group of people, at first indentured servants, and later on increasingly slaves. Now, key thing is, we got our gold and silver. Virginia's gold and silver, as John Wolfe saw it, was this plant, tobacco. And we go from this period where they're hungry for food, literally starving to death, to now with tobacco, you're hungry for land. You want land because that's where the wealth comes in play. And that brings us to how labor and race and class in Virginia was this fascinating thing. Because you need a labor force, and who's going to do it? You're going to have racial issues, and you're going to have class issues. And in another lecture, we're going to take a look at the big one, because if you're thinking the guys and the gals that are going to go out there and do the work, you probably all know it, right? It's going to be... Welcome to slavery. Slaves 
slave labor, and slave labor is going to be introduced to Virginia in 1619, where roughly 20 African people are sold into the colony by a Dutch ship planting the seeds of slavery in English North America, but slave labor is not going to be the key in the beginning. By 1650, there's something like 300 African slaves in the colony of Virginia. So who's going to do it? Who's going to be the labor force in Virginia? And the answer is indentured servants. Now, there's a couple things about these indentured servants. First up, how are you going to get land if you're a Virginian? What's the system? And the idea of land was real simple. If you paid for someone to come over or you bought your own journey passage to the New World, you would get 50 acres of land. And this system was called the Headright System. This land belongs. This land belongs. This land belongs to me. This land belongs to me. And every Virginian who brought over someone and paid for their voyage got this land. And this head right system was very successful at doing two things. Populating the colony and ensuring that some people had a whole bunch of land. Now the more important thing in Virginia is who's going to do the labor? Who's going to whistle while they work? Just whistle while you work. And the answer to that question is indentured servants. And indentured servitude is an interesting, you know, labor system. And basically, it was pretty simple. If you were someone, uh, usually poor, over from England, and you signed a contract anywhere from four, five, six, seven years, term of service, you would promise to work the land for that amount of time. And at the end of your contract, when you were done, you would be promised land and money. And there's a potential that you can move up in the economic ladder. And indentured servants are going to be the primary labor force of Virginia. Now here's the problem. In the early period, not a whole lot of indentured servants are going to survive to the end of their contract. They're going to die of disease or overwork or abuse or Native American attacks or a whole bunch of other things that could kill you. So indentured servants, though, are the labor force of Virginia in the beginning. Now what happens is the colony's growing, and it's growing, and it's growing, and it's growing, and the people are moving further and further inland along this kind of tidewater region. This is the best land along the James River, but more and more people are establishing settlements in the backcountry. Now, if you can't see the writing on the wall, it's going to smack you across the face, and the problem is you're going to come into contact with Native American people who are increasingly going to be concerned about encroachments on their land. Another problem is when you are expanding tobacco production, you are destroying the soil because tobacco needs to, you know, let the soil rest for a while so it can regain its nutrients. So the colony is growing. Some people are becoming very profitable. You have these huge plantations. You have this economic system built upon indentured servitude. And then you got some problems. Big problem number one happens when a new governor comes into town. That guy, Lord Delaware, he arrives in 1610, offering the colony reinforcements. And basically what he does is he starts attacking the Native Americans in the region. He's a veteran of fighting the Irish over in Europe. And he uses really, really hardcore tactics like lighting up. Native American food supplies on fire to deal with them, and he basically is ordered by the Virginia Company of London to clear them out. Clear out the Native Americans in the area, burn the villages, burn the crops, get rid of them. Now, this first Anglo-Powhatan War lasts from 1610 all the way to 1614. Four years of on-again, off-again fighting. And eventually it comes to an end with a truce, and it's, of course, ended with an act of love. When Pocahontas and John Wolfe get married in 1614, first interracial marriage in Virginia, and the story of Pocahontas is, you know, very different than the Disney film would have you believe, but you still got this lingering tension because the colonists and the natives stop fighting 
temporarily, but you still got the problem of the colonists want land, they want it for their cash crop, and the people who occupy that land are the native people. 1614, the first Anglo-Powhatan War stops, and it's 1622, you have the second Powhatan War. The second Anglo-Powhatan War takes place when the native people, realizing that their future is looking more and more bleak, launch a huge attack on the colony of Virginia. Over 300 colonists are killed during the fighting, and the fighting will go on for a number of years, like almost a decade of on-again, off-again fighting. Over 300 colonists killed, and that's a third of the English-speaking population of the region. It's a pretty gnarly thing. Many, many more Native Americans are going to be killed when everything is said and done. It's a huge massacre for the colonists. It's a huge victory temporarily for the Native Americans. But after 10 years, the fighting comes to an end. And the goal of the colonists from this point forward is to get rid, to exterminate the Native population of the region. The company, the Virginia Company, goes bankrupt as a result of this uprising and other financial difficulties. And something significant happens because in 1624, the king revokes the charter of the colony. The bankrupt joint stock company is stripped of its charter and the king takes over the colony of Virginia, making it a royal colony. And basically, from this point forward, the colony of Virginia is going to be governed based upon these ideas of mercantilism, where the whole purpose of the colony is to benefit the mother country. Now back to the Native Americans. After the kind of second Anglo-Powhatan War comes to an end, the Native people are thinking, one last hoorah, let's get rid of these people who don't belong, and they launch in 1644. The second, in some books they call it the second Anglo-Powhatan War, but really it's the third. For two years, the fighting takes place again. They're kind of hoping to strike a blow to get rid of these colonists, and hundreds of people die, and the native people, one last hoorah, fail to achieve their goal. And it basically seals the fate of the Native American tribes in the Chesapeake region, because after this point, there is no real resistance left. In fact, there by the late 17th century, late 1600s, the population of the native people is decimated in the re region. Disease causes all sorts of havoc, and it is now the case that the colony can expand without any opposition. And it's important to note that the native resistance really kind of fails because of these three Ds. You have disease, enormous amount of disease, one of the biggest kind of factors in the decline of the population of the native people in the Chesapeake is things like smallpox and measles which they have no immunity to. Disease really creates all sorts of havoc. You got disorganization. The native people were not a cohesive group. They were confederacy and it sounds strong, the Powhatan confederacy, but the reality is it was weak. It was a bunch of tribes, there were rivalries, and so they're not really able to mount a huge organized resistance. And the other one is disposability. And what's important to keep in mind is unlike with Spain where the native people were the labor force or with the French where they needed them for the fur trade, the English colonists don't need them. They don't need them for food, they grow their own crops, and if anything, they're in the way of this land that they want for their cash crops, tobacco. So this kind of marks the end of native resistance in the region. Last thing about Virginia you should know about is something really significant, which is the House of Burgess. The House of Burgess is a significant thing because in 1619 you get the first instance of representative government in North America. 
represent, represent, because what the House of Burgess was, was the first instance of the colonists having rights to be involved in the political process. It was created by the Virginia Company, and the whole purpose is you want to get people to come, so you got to give them some sort of, you know, rights that they would not have possibly in other parts of the world. And the idea was, basically... If you vote for me, all of your wildest dreams will come true. There would be a lower house, and there would be 22 representatives, Burgess, each settlement would vote, and those individuals would represent their particular region of the colony. And this idea, this House of Burgess, was in North America an example of representative governments. And it's only in the British colonies, because they didn't have this in the French or the Spanish colonies. It makes Virginia and it makes the British colonies unique that citizens are voting for people to represent their interest. And this is kind of going to kind of going to be like a baby parliament for the colonists. And this is going to give them a degree of freedom that they're going to eventually want to expand on. This closes out our lecture on Virginia. These are the key terms. If you're studying for A-Push or U.S. History, I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Hit like on the thumbs up sign and tell all your friends about the Joe's Productions videos that you're learning all sorts of smart things from. And finally, don't forget, send wedding gifts to me and my lovely girl, Pocahontas. I stole her from John Rolfe. Peace.